We good? All right. You ready, Randy? Yeah, man, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Alliance Group Podcast. We have an incredibly special guest joining us uh, for our episode today, Mr. Rennie Curran, uh, an entrepreneur, an author, a professional keynote speaker, and the CEO of Game Changer Coaching. Rennie, it is so awesome to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me on, man. I'm excited. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, right off the bat, I have to say, huge Georgia Bulldog uh, supporters and fans here in the Alliance Group office. Uh, We all love the Bulldogs, and Rennie, you are one of my very favorite to watch play. Uh, Had an absolutely amazing career back in 2007 to 2009, Yeah, um, and it was just a joy to watch you play, so it was a real thrill to get to meet you and to have you as a guest Uh, on this podcast. You've done some really amazing things on the athletic field, of course, um, but it's, you know, arguably some even more amazing things in your career after playing. So we're going to delve into that uh, today. And thank you again so much uh, for for being here to talk with us about it. Yeah, no problem. It's an honor. It's been a journey. And, uh, you know, uh, with everything that I've gone through, man, uh, the biggest thing for me now is taking those lessons and uh, the experiences and pouring it into somebody else. So if you're listening and you're an, an aspiring athlete, you're a former athlete, you're an entrepreneur, you're a business leader who's trying to take you know yourself individually or your team or organization to the next level, then this is a podcast you're going to want to listen to because I'm, you know, I'm going to be an open book, man, and excited to just chat with you, man, about these things. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think we, we were kind of talking before the podcast, and I think for people to understand um, the power of the message that you're able to deliver and the education and training that you're able to deliver, they, they really need to understand where where you're coming from. Your backstory uh, is really incredible, and honestly, one that I didn't know about mm-hmm. uh, as someone who just loved watching you play football. Um, yeah. But but your backstory is really incredible. The, the the son of two Liberian immigrants, correct? Correct. Yeah. So yeah. you, I mean, it was it, it's a really crazy story. Your mom came to the United States on scholarship to get her master's degree from Liberia. Oh yeah, and it's it's such a deep story and a powerful story, like you said. I'm yeah. definitely somebody who's a product of grace and a product of my village and the people around me, as many of us are. But yeah, my mom uh, came here ten dollars in her pocket, didn't know a way around, came on scholarship. That was her her ticket. And when I look at even uh, deeper, my uh, grandparents they both were the first in their families to be educated. So there's a common thread of education that leads to empowerment of not just uh, themselves, but everybody around them. Right. And so that was the story with my mother. She came over um, just, you know, uh, with that mission, man, to elevate, you know, not only herself, but everybody around her. When she was finished getting her master's from Emory, she ended up working at different hospitals around Atlanta. So Uh at DeKalb Medical, um, she worked at Grady for the longest. She was a uh, diabetes uh, nurse and educator. Wow. And then uh, my father came when she was done, and he did what a lot of immigrants do. He left uh, Liberia working for the Liberian government, right? helping uh, with, like, rural development and education. And when he came here, the skill that he picked up, and I, I joke about it all the time uh, because he got his skill from a friend. So basically his friend did shoe repair, and so that was the skill that he learned because that was what... Learned from his friend. Yeah, he learned from wow. his friend, and it was just really to survive. And I tell my dad all the time, like, Dad, if, you know, you realize if your friends were all CEO uh, CEOs of banks or, you know, doctors, you would have basically done, that. done the same. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, but he picked up that skill, man, and it wasn't, you know, I always have to clarify because it's not, you know, what you think about when you think about shoe repair or shoe shining, uh-huh. like when you go to the airport, right? like it was a very unique skill um, that paid a lot. I mean, fixing cowboy boots, designer shoes, things like that. He uh, eventually got a, uh, a uh, shop out in Kennesaw uh-huh. in Town Center Mall and everything. So we drive from like North True Hills, Beaver Highway, kind of uh, you know, metro Atlanta area all the way an hour to Kennesaw back and wow. forth for 12 hours a day. So, just extremely hard working, humble people, man. That was my earliest experiences. Yeah, and you had that. You that's maybe where you 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 got your entrepreneurial spirit, right? Exactly. Watching your dad build that business and go through all of the things that it takes. Uh, entrepreneurship is is mm-hmm. is not an easy road. Um, there are there's a lot of, of work that goes into it, sacrifice that goes into it. That sometimes you can't see from the outside. You look at a successful entrepreneur, 
You yeah. might see the success, but you don't see all of the work. Oh, that yeah. Went into that. It, it was twofold for my dad because I, I did see the grind of entrepreneurship and just the dedication him wearing five different hats, which is, you know, the, yeah. the stage one of entrepreneurship. Oh, like yeah. You, you're the manager, you're the marketing person, sales, <laughs> <laughs> everything, customer service. Yeah. Uh, he was horrible at that. I saw him cuss out a lot of people. <laughs> uh, so I saw that, man, and, and have so much respect for him for the dedication and the work ethic that he has and just even why he was doing it. You know, he didn't have to tell me why I saw it. Um, there was a civil war that uh, was going on during the time that I was born. And, right. Um, you know, yeah. over 400,000 people lost their lives. Um, a million, over a million became displaced, which included a lot of my family. So a lot of the work uh, and, that he was doing and the money that he was making it was sending a lot of that back home and helping cousins, uncles, aunts, uh, not just come here and give them a plane ticket, but like literally pay for their immigration papers, then to be legal, like get them started, you know, yeah. with a whole new life, man. So saw that. And then on the other side of it, you know, maybe like five years later, he ended up losing his business. So I saw firsthand what happens when you attach your identity to what you do and how devastating that is when you remove something that is, mm -hmm. is part of you. Um, especially as a man, you know, because you, you feel, and I saw it, I, I still saw my dad as the same person, as the same man, but uh, I could tell that he didn't see himself that way. Right. He didn't see himself as valuable once he lost that business. And so it was almost like foreshadowing for me, um, you know, with my experiences and things that I would go through right. that you don't have to attach your identity to your job and to your ability to perform and to provide. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's it really is um, a, a very unique um, situation that you came from, and again, it kind of these th these themes that that you discuss, um, sometimes things that appear negative uh, can be turned into a positive as long as you learn the lessons uh, from those experiences, and then you can apply them. Yeah, uh, g going forward, which is a recurring theme throughout your your life. Um, you 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 loved football from a young age. Obviously, you were a star every time you, you stepped on the football field, and it became apparent, I'm sure, pretty quickly that you might have opportunities to play at a higher level, something that always kind of followed you throughout your career is people always thought that you were undersized, right? 5'11", you're playing linebacker, which is, for those of you who might not watch football, that is a, that is a mean, nasty position uh, <laughs> where you have the meanest, nastiest, fastest, strongest guys playing defense. Um, a lot of folks, even in high school, were saying 5'11", maybe too small to, to, to be a linebacker. What did that do for you in hearing that feedback throughout your career? How did that shape you? And I'll go back, man, because on what you said, because I was not always the best. I, I, <laughs> both my parents, like I just I said, assumed. <laughs> yeah. Now, most people, most people do assume, man, uh, and that's after the years and years have passed, and you see more of the finished product. Wow. But um, my parents knew nothing about football whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They didn't know anything about SEC. They knew nothing about Georgia. They didn't, <laughs> knew nothing about what a third down was or anything. like. So wow. for me to be uh, able to look back and hear, every time I hear my bio now, it's just like, wow. Because I, I just think about how far I've come. And uh, I think about myself like uh, likened to uh, Charlie from Charlie and, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah. Like I just you know, got that golden ticket. And for me, that was my circumstances. Like, I just so happened to move to a community in Gwinnett that was like, you know, Brookwood, mm -hmm. uh, powerhouse football. Good and football, yeah. Just happened to uh, join a Little League team with the coach that was a the biggest Georgia fan, wow. Ronnie Benton, yeah, who happened to uh, treat me like his own son. And he happened to uh, take it upon himself to introduce me to a trainer by the name of Chip Smith who happened to take a liking to me. And... Um, he was one of the, the top trainers at that time, trained like Brian Erlacher, uh, Jesse Tuggle, yeah. I mean, so many guys. So I walk into that facility, and I'm seeing NFL jerseys hanging up at 12 years old. You know, yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely a kid who got the golden ticket, and that's why I'm so big on giving back. But just that's going awesome. back to my journey, man, I, I was never the kid who showed up and was just the best player. I, wow. I played offensive line my first year. <laughs> like that's crazy. I literally, man. yeah, I literally. I did not know this part of your story. I just yeah. assumed. Well, I mean, from what I saw when you were on the field at Georgia, I was like, oh, "Well, this guy's probably been the best player on every field he's ever stepped on." Yeah, man. Nah, it, it was like a process of discovery, um, playing the game, and just you know everything from learning my position to learning the fundamentals, and uh, you know. So, like I said, offensive lineman first year, uh, second year, played running back. 
Mm-hmm. So I, ha- I had the raw materials, but I didn't have the knowledge. So it was all about that consistent growth and yep. incremental gain. Um, so played running back first couple years, got to high school, didn't get along with the coach. He moved me to linebacker. Got pissed off. <laughs> I was ready to quit. <laughs> And uh, that's when I went to my Little League coach, and he t- he told me one of the things that sticks with me most to this day, and he said, Rennie, I want you to do something for me. He's like, you can't control, you know, your coach. You can't control these different circumstances, but I just want you to focus on what you can control. Mm-hmm. And that was like the catalyst for me to, you know, along with everything else that was going on in my life because it was an extremely tough time. Right. But that was one of the main catalysts that hit a switch for me, man, that, Made me say, okay, I don't care what happens. Like, I'm not going to let anybody stop me from getting to where I need to go. And so I, I tell everybody now, I'm like, I was like, water boy, Adam <laughs> Sandler. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. From that point on, I was like, I'm either going to be at the ball or I'm going to make every single play. And just by making that decision, it created a mentality that got me um, moved up from freshman in high school to varsity after my freshman year. It got me, that was what got me. Recruited by Georgia, that's what, you know, that was the common thread was just this belief and this standard that I set where I didn't care what the circumstances were. First quarter, fourth quarter uh, of the game, I'm only going one speed. And it it wasn't just also about performance. It was also about character. I was like, man, I'm just going to be a good person. I'm just going to go hard. I'm going to treat people with respect. Yep. And. You know, and I just trusted that good things were going to happen. And it did. A, a lot of times it didn't look like that at first. Right. Because there was many times where I just had to work hard in the dark. Like those times where I was hearing I was too short, the times I was scout mm-hmm. team, the times I was second string, not being acknowledged. But I just kept getting the reps, man. And that's such a powerful message for life because you're a lot of times, many of us, many, I'm sure many people listening right now, you're not in the place that you want to be. Well, this is some area of your life, relationships, yep. business-wise, some area. It's just like you have an itch that you know you're you you know you're not where you need to be. The potential that you see is not your current reality. Your vision doesn't look like your current circumstances. But I'm telling you, you keep getting the reps. You keep trusting. You keep going. I mean, working in the dark. Yep. Something good is going to happen. And that was like a recurring theme at every single level of my career. Yeah, and it, it, you know, you ended up getting uh, a- after your high school days um, a scholarship offer yeah. uh, from Georgia. I watched this th- this clip of Mark Rick telling this story, where you know you 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 needed that scholarship, man. What? <laughs> yeah, that that scholarship was uh, that was another guy moment. You know, like it was just so so hard during that time, man. Like I mentioned, my dad he lost his business, right. During that time, this was like eighth eighth grade going into ninth grade, he lost his business. And so from there he was uh he worked at a mental health institution, taxi cab driver, almost lost his life, like I was telling you earlier. Yeah. Got a gosh. gun pulled on him, the guy pulled the trigger and the gun got jammed. And this man, when they got to him, when they got to the car, there was a bag of bullets. Like so he was basically gonna use my dad's taxi cab to do a bank robbery. Yep. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And and so so by that, mom had almost died from a surgery she had gotten. So she was on her deathbed, like, that whole year around that same time. So we never really bounced back. Like, we just paycheck to paycheck. I'm yeah. on free and reduced lunch meals in the suburbs in Brookwood. Yeah. Um, you know, and just always was, this kid, was a kid who needed a ride, who needed a scholarship. You know, that, that was me during that time. And so, like I said, I, I'm just working extremely hard, just believing in the dark, man, and, and just, like, you know, trainers are let me train for free, so I'm going there every day after after um, school. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, on top of that, man, my oldest sister, because she was born in Liberia, when it was time for her to go to uh, college, she was extremely smart, just like my mom. She got the brains of the family. Yeah. But she got all the scholarships, but because she was not a citizen, she didn't have all her papers, they took all of her scholarships. And so my parents, they – pulled out their 401ks and all their savings oh and they paid for her to go. So when I saw them do that, I was like, all right, <laughs> well, I got no choice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have to, I have to make it. And that was part of my grind and my dedication was just that desperation. It was like, I, I have no choice. There is no if choice. I want to live my dream, it, it's not, you know, about how bad my parents want it. It's not how bad this coach wanted. I have to want this and I have to want it every single day. And I can't depend on anybody to show up for me. Oh, God will be with me, but I got to put that work in like he's not with me. That's a, <laughs> that's a lot of pressure on a on a, on a a high school senior, you know. Man, yeah, 15, 16 years old. And uh, I just felt like I had the 
wrote on my shoulders. And then on top of it, it was hearing you're too short, you know, and every time I heard that, it was just more fuel. Um, mm-hmm. it, it made me want to put a little bit more weight on the bar. Right. Maybe yeah. want to go just a little bit harder um, in terms of my preparation. So when I got out there, man, there was no um, ifs and buts about it. Like I was leaving every single thing out there and I was mentally, physically, spiritually prepared to perform at my highest level. When you get to, uh, to, to Georgia, um, you know, what, what, obviously you've, you've overcome so much already just to be on that field, just to be wearing, Mm -hmm. uh, that Jersey and, 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 and to be that scholarship player that you were, what kind of challenges did you see at Georgia? I mean, honestly, looking at your track record there, it doesn't look Mm -hmm. like there were many challenges. You, you, you kind of came right out of the gate, but I'm sure there was some Lots of challenges. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of challenges. Like I said, and, and uh, when I think about it, it's like you see in every every person's story, you see the finished product and, you know, the sure. accolades. But then there's always that backstory. How did they there's get always, there? Yeah, right. there's always the, the origin backstory? story. So for me, when I got to Georgia, man, uh, and even when it came down to it, they really fought. Like Coach uh, Bobo was the one who recruited me, Mike mm-hmm. Bobo. And he was like, he, he just told me this recently that he literally had to like fight tooth and nail for them to give me that scholarship. Like he had to stand on it. Like basically a career defining. Hey, wow. I'm betting yeah. on this kid. I'm vouching. Yeah, I'm vouching. Hundred percent. Yeah, he was a little drunk when he told me, but I was, <laughs> that's how I knew he was honest. Oh, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, man, it it was like just them taking that chance on me, and then I'm getting up there. Um, I'm doing well, but the first thing, and this this happens at every level, um, especially in sports, like you walk into that locker room and immediately you start looking around you and mm-hmm. you start observing the talent and that pressure hits, oh, yeah. man. You're like, man, dang, that dude is 6'6", he's 315, and, I mean, he's a freshman too. Yeah. Or this other guy, he, you know, he's a junior and he's 6'3", 215, and that's mm-hmm. what I'm supposed to look like. Right. He's number one coming out, you know, in, in the nation, not just the state. He's the num- number one in his position, and I got to compete with him. Uh-huh. Get a spot. So there's those, all those mental gymnastics that happen yep. where you're questioning yourself, you're questioning your, your ability. Um, there's imposter syndrome, like, dang, do I really belong here? Mm-hmm. Uh, then you get on the field, or even before you get on the field, you're in the weight room, and, you know, you got to compete in the weight room. You got to compete with the sprints, and, it's such a long journey just getting to uh, getting on the field. And that's if you ever get on the field. Some guys get there and they're highly touted and they never even hit the field. Like yeah. That's that's crazy when you think about <laughs> it's it. It's nuts, isn't it? Yeah, because you've already worked so hard just to get there. But for me, it was once again working in the dark, like going back to what I know, my norm, which is not being the guy who's uh, recognized, uh, being the guy who's laughed at, too short. Um, that was my early days at Georgia. The freshman from Snellville with braces that's trying to play linebacker, trying to start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it just did not look the part, man. And uh, it just came down to getting, once again, uh, getting in the weight room, putting the extra 20, 30 pounds on that I was supposed to. Controlling what you can control. Yeah, controlling what I can control. Uh, getting in the film room by myself, watching Tony Taylor, watching uh, Thomas Davis, watching uh, Odell Thurman. Um, mm-hmm. I would study those guys, man, like religiously. After everybody was gone, I'm still in that film room for extra hour, two hours. And I did that, uh, you know, all of the off season. I did that even when the season started because they didn't register me. Mm-hmm. But I, I wasn't playing at all. I'm just on the sidelines for like the first six, seven weeks, man. And it got to a point where I started doubting. I, I started getting frustrated like, dang, man, I'm putting this work and I'm doing what I need to do. I'm asking the coach, hey, coach, how can I be more valuable? Right. I'm, I'm doing this for the right reasons. I'm not just out here because I want to just be out here. I want to, I want to contribute to the team. Right. And, um, it was about the, like I said, eight, seventh, eighth game of the season came. We're playing Tennessee and, um, we're losing like, and and this was a recurring thing in my career too. Either (laughs) every time I got promoted, it was somebody got hurt or somebody messed up Uh and we were losing already. Right. So it really wasn't, you know, um, so it was just bad circumstances, but, we're losing by like three touchdowns against Tennessee, which is the worst place to lose because you're gonna hear that Rocky oh, Top song oh, over yeah. and over until your ears bleed. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, the uh, linebacker ahead of me messes up on a play. Uh, they score a touchdown, like the final mm-hmm. touchdown for the day. Mm-hmm. And then um, I get the call from the sidelines, and it's my linebackers coach. And he's like, "Rennie, you're in." And that 
that was uh, that transcending moment, man, that I was ready for. Yeah. Um, so long before. For yeah, it. I'd been preparing for it, man. And so I stepped in and made like the first one or two tackles and never looked back. And wow. that that I think about all the time because of the fact that so many times in life, it's like you're working, you're working, you're working, and you can't see the other side of when that breakthrough is going to happen. Right. You just have to know and trust and believe that it's, it's going to come. And it usually happens, number one, in a situation that does not make sense. Like, it, it's not happy. It's not good. Mm-hmm. That's usually when that breakthrough happens. And, and two, it's going to happen when you least expect it. Right. You know, when you least ex- expect it, that's when that transcending moment happens. And then, of course, when people look at you, they'll be like, oh, man, he's he's just lucky. He's just talented. Right. Not right. knowing you, you had that moment that's happened that nobody saw. Uh, and everything, but that was that was one of the the moments, man, that transcended things and, and took things to the next level. And you ended up starting as a freshman. How many yeah. games did you start as a true freshman? I think I started thirteen games as a true freshman, and um, wow, yeah, ended up being a freshman All American, and, yep. and yeah, the rest was history. And then yeah, the rest is history, indeed. All American honors as a sophomore, first team All SEC as a junior, first team All American uh, as a junior as well. You led the SEC with one hundred and sixteen tackles. Um, and just a fantastic college football player. Again, I'll say one of my favorite to ever watch. Uh, you were just so fast to the ball. You were always <laughs> just so full of energy. Your hair is on fire everywhere you were going and just laying huge licks. Uh, a real, real pleasure to watch play the game. Uh, and it led to uh, you actually getting drafted to the league, right? Yeah, left uh, early as a junior. Mm-hmm. And uh, my big thing was I wanted to help my family. My daughter was born after my sophomore year, so – Wanted to really just provide, man, and, and um, not have to struggle anymore. So that was a big part of it. One right. of the toughest decisions in my life um, that I really had to uh, pray about a lot, man. It, it was tough because I was a team captain at that time. Yeah, and, you had really grown um, into a leadership role. Yeah, and so it, it was a struggle. And it's like once you make that decision, it's not just like you're going to play for another team. Mm-hmm. Now it's you talk about going from college to the pros, you become a business overnight. Right. You become a CEO. So I'm 21, 20, going to 22. And now I had to get an agent. Now I had to get a financial advisor. Now I had to get, you know, a, a chiropractor and, and all these different pieces that I didn't really think about, have to think about before right. to really sustain myself and my body, which is now my business. Mm-hmm. So it changed things a lot. And people talk about this a lot as well, too, uh, in terms of, like, your uh, when you rise and when you get to another, uh, another level in terms of success and status and fame, you may not change, but all of a sudden the people around you start to change in yep. terms of how they perceive you. So that was another thing that I had to navigate at that early age that I didn't really understand until years later. Right. Yeah. It's funny. People look at you and they see someone, well, this guy's could probably got money. This guy's probably exactly. this. And everything changes about the way that people treat you. You go from this kind of underdog that people are rooting for to this, you know, maybe mm-hmm. people are a little jealous or a little, you know, or, or, or want something from you. Yeah. Um, um, that's, it's always, a a, a, a challenge when you do discover success, um, in the NFL, uh, you know, it, it, you had, you had a lot of challenging things happen right out the gate, right? The NFL lockout happened. Um, you went to the Tennessee Titans, uh, drafted in the third round. Uh, they bring a new coach in and it's obvious that he, they already had a plan from the beginning to draft another linebacker, um, you don't really feel like you got your shot at the NFL the way that you had earned your shot in high school. You had earned your shot at UGA. You didn't get the chance to earn a shot in, in the NFL, right? Yeah, it, it was extremely frustrating. And there's always more you can do. You can go back and forth in your head like, man, if I had done this, I had done that. But the, the fact of the matter is, like, it, it just was not the right circumstances. Every year that I played in the NFL, I had a new coaching staff. So right. they fired my staff after – Jeff Fisher and staff after my rookie season uh-huh. and everything. Then, like you said, the lockout happened. Mm-hmm. And so we didn't have an off season. That's, that's when we literally went straight into training camp. Oh, right. So yeah. you didn't even have OTAs and all the different things. And you mentioned the, the coaching staff came in. The first thing I remember reading the newspaper article, the first thing he said is we want a bigger front seven. That basically meant not me. <laughs> Talking so, to Rennie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so they drafted two, two linebackers and they brought in one through free agency and if you know anything about free agency, like, you know, they spend that money. Yep. And when they spend that money, that guarantees that that player is going to play. So He's going to get every opportunity. Yeah, every uh, opportunity. Yeah. So I went in thinking, you know, this is my year. I'm, I'm going to hopefully get a chance to compete. I even led the team in tackles. 
<laughs> during that year. It still got cut. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> still got cut. And this is this is something that happens to so many players throughout the league, man. That um, you know, you'll find fans saying, "Oh, what? I wonder what happened to so and so. I wonder what happened to this player. They were so good." Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, it had nothing to do with their performance. It had everything to do with this is a business, politics, and business. Yeah. yeah. And if you think about it, like now that I'm a I'm a CEO of my own business, I see it through a different lens. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you take the emotions out of it. But back then, I was so frustrated. Like, I don't understand, but. Being a CEO now, I, I see I see it for what it is. You're a product, mm -hmm. and like any business owner, any wise business owner, if you have a product that you can pay less for and get more value out of, you're going to pay less. Yeah. Or if you've already invested in a product, you're not just going to discard that thing. You're going to get your return on your investment. It's true. So it's the same thing with the NFL. You have guys who get to their third year, and they are you know what's co considered a salary cap casualty because – they may not be, uh, they may be a starter, but they may not be playing two positions. Whereas they can get a younger guy right. who can do multiple things, who they can pay, or maybe one thing, but mm -hmm. they see more potential in him for whatever reason. Yep. They can they pay, can pay him, him less. Yeah, 400000 for that year versus one point two that it's going to cost you. Yep. So it's no, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> and, yep. so, and that's what happens a lot, man. Um, it's, and it's extremely, extremely tough because you work so hard. And I had that same mentality that I did in high school mm -hmm. at Georgia where I'm like, man, okay, if I just put extra reps and if I just work extra hard, if I just develop good relationship. Right. And it's like you get to that level and it's like, nah. Well, the problem is, I mean, yeah, <laughs> even if you did all those things, then the coaching staff all gets fired and all exactly. that work that you did to create those impressions, right? Yeah. It's all gone. Now you got to start all over. Yeah, uh, man. So, so. It, it was a tough pill to swallow, but – it really was one of the best things that happened to me at that time in my life. Because one of the things it forced me to do was it forced me to think outside of the box. And so, and, and I think about it now, when you get put into circumstances that are not in your control, mm -hmm. you have two choices. You can either allow that circumstance to de define you and define how you're going to perceive it, the narrative that you tell yourself, what you're going to do from that point on, you can let it define you or you can let your vision drive you and push you forward and allow you to think outside the box and expand your skills and start to um, look at it as an opportunity versus a setback. Right. And this is, you know, these are all themes that you work in and, and uh, all of this, I, I thought it was very important um, to establish this incredible, you know, this incredible backstory, your, your, your football career, you know, starting with your childhood through high school, through college and, 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 and and becoming a professional football player, first of all, that's an amazing yeah. thing that not very very few people ever in history have have gotten to realize that dream. That's incredible in and of itself. It's an amazing success story, uh, and that that journey was filled with so many challenges that had to be overcome, uh, so many lessons learned that you now get to apply uh, to your business um, as CEO of of uh, game changer coaching. So talk to me about when you, when did you start to uh, think of the idea of, of creating this company and creating a business for something that, that, that you would do in life after football? Yeah, honestly, man, it, it started very early in my career, even before I got to that point mm -hmm. where I got cut. So my whole perspective while I was playing football was I don't want to be seen as that dumb jock. Like I don't want to just, do an interview. I want to give thought provoking answers right. um, that really allow people to know about who I am outside of just my jersey. I was a musician. Most people don't know that. Right. You I played up, three instruments. Yeah. I grew up playing the piano, drums, viola. And it was such a great blessing that my parents weren't sports fans or didn't know anything mm -hmm. because they raised me to be holistic, mm -hmm. not just an athlete. Right. Uh, and which I think is super important for any parents listening, like do not raise your child to just only see themselves as an athlete, raise them to see themselves as a whole person that can accomplish anything that can be great at whatever. Right. So my parents wouldn't have cared if I was an artist or if I was, you know, uh, selling food, like mm -hmm. they still would have, uh, you know, supported me and encouraged me and everything. So it really started there. And when I got cut, that allowed me the time and the ability to start to delve into those other areas so one of the first things when I got cut, man, uh, I went through that period of training and waiting on a phone call. And that light bulb hit where I was like, man, I'm not going to wait on anybody 
ever again in my life to give me an opportunity. Whether these jokers call me back or not, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make sure that I make the most of this time. Mm -hmm. So I started going to workshops. I started meeting with business leaders. I started uh, writing. I started reading tons of books, man, on leadership and mindset and personal development. Napoleon Hill, Law of Success was one of the first books I read. And then I read Og Mandino, Greatest Salesman in the World, and, and just started like filling myself up, man, with positivity and and developing myself and understanding myself as well. I did a uh, uh, um, SWOT analysis on myself. SWOT which, analysis, which is an acronym. Yeah, looking looking at my strengths, my weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and then looking at what skills do I have that can add value to the the business world. If I can never go back to playing mm -hmm. again, one of the things that I landed on was my ability to communicate because I didn't even realize I had gotten a million reps from doing pregame speeches to doing postgame interviews. Yeah, those were that was public speaking. That's I just didn't even know it. Speaking. Yeah, <laughs> so. Wow. So once I landed on those, that being one of my uh, skills that I could do in my sleep, basically, then I started sharpening it and I started getting the reps. So once again, started writing. I started working on my book, Free Agent. And then I also started speaking and I, I had always kind of done it, but now I was doing it in an intentional way. I was speaking, started speaking at schools, started going to churches, built my website, uh, use Wix and just built my website from scratch. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I would stay up till like two AM as I'm still and I'm still training during this time. So I'll be right, training you're three still hours in the a day. NFL. Yeah, still <laughs> yeah. pursuing that. So yeah. I didn't just, you know, walk away from it. I'm still pursuing the NFL. But mm -hmm. my mindset was like, I'm gonna get the most out of this time, man. Whether it's playing the NFL or whether it's going into business or whatever I do, I'm gonna make sure that I just maximize everything that I have uh, in my hand. That's incredible, man. And it, it, it's it's completely uh paid off. You are now uh, you know, entrepreneur, uh, author. As you said, uh, free agent, the perspectives of a young African American athlete. Tell me about uh, that book and um, what what was your purpose in in putting that book together? Yeah, man. Uh, so it was such a transformational moment. Like I mentioned, when I got cut and I went through the whole um, just all the mental gymnastics of figuring out my identity and who I was outside of that jersey and what really made me who I am. Like. Right. I asked myself questions like, okay, uh, am I really confident in myself or is it just uh, stemming from my ability to be on a field and have people clap for me mm -hmm. and celebrate me? Am I really self-motivated? You know, and uh, What is my faith, really, if I'm not on that field and if things aren't going well? Um, so that was a lot of uh, where uh, the catalyst for the book came from, was exploring my identity and where I was going and the fact that I didn't want to give up on my dreams and taking it a step further of thinking about not just where I was at that time, but also so many other people who would be in this place or who had gone through that same experience. Like I mentioned my dad who lost his business, you know, just thinking about individuals like him, uh, people who go through all types of times of transitions. And that's what really the concept of free agent uh, came to be. It wasn't necessarily about getting cut from your team. It was about going through a time of transition. So whether you go from being married to divorce, whether you go from having a job to no job, business owner to um, losing your business, uh, we all go through times of adversity and times of transition. So it's about who do you become when you remove all those things and who are you when you remove all those things right. from your life? The title, the money, you know, all the things that give you that sense of security and certainty. And it was such a, a powerful moment being able to uh, write that book because it was super therapeutic. Know, in order to really connect with people and help them to understand your perspective, you have to dive deep into your thoughts and your emotions and your feelings. And if you're telling the story you, and you're not going to be there with that person as they're uh, reading it, you have to be very descriptive. And that requires a lot of energy just to yeah. think about your emotions and think. And so I, there was times where I'd be writing and I'd be crying, man, yeah. like just thinking about certain experiences and, and trying to get it across. And when I eventually put it out there, which that took a lot, man, I, and pasta syndrome very, was very there. personal. Yeah. Oh yeah. Took yeah. a lot of courage, man. But one thing that, uh, and this is for anybody listening who wants to be an author, who wants to start that business, man, you have to put yourself in the environment of your vision. And for me, that looked like putting myself in a Barnes and Noble and just walking around and looking at the different books. Mm -hmm. And that gave me the encouragement to know that. And if all these people can write books that I've never met cookbooks, you know, right. uh, geography books, 
romance novels. All right. these people have written books. They've taken a chance. I don't know who they are. I probably will never know who they are. Uh-huh. So why not me? And <laughs> so uh, that gave me the encouragement to do it and to take that risk. And so release the book and the uh, the feedback was immediate, man. It was it was powerful just to see how many people were impacted by it that I never even thought would be impacted by it. I mean, I remember because uh, I was I was back in Athens during that time that I released the book and released it at G-Day. But maybe like a week later, I got a message at like 2 a.m. from a soldier in Afghanistan who had read it during his security post. Oh, man. Like, yeah, awesome. just like stories like that, man. And it wasn't like it didn't take long. So it was just crazy just to see that you can take a chance on something and that it has ripple effects, man. It, it, it affects so many people around you. So, yeah. That's incredible. And you actually, it's not, not the only book that you've written. Uh, you also wrote, uh, a, a, you co-wrote a book, actually, with yeah. your daughter, Eliana. Uh, tell me about that book. What does it take to be a star? Yeah, so I uh, wrote that book, man. It, it was a vision that just hit me in the middle of the night, and my daughter was with me at that time. It was around 2000. 16, 2017, so I was towards the end of my career, mm-hmm. and I had um, torn my patella tendon, so my career was, was pretty much over. I was ready to transition, and, um, you know, I asked her, hey, you want to write a book with Dad? You want to be an author? Of course, she's, <laughs> she's like seven, eight, she's like, yeah, Dad, like. Oh, that's awesome. And so uh, she helped me with the book, but the, the book, the premise for that was really um, similar to Free Agent, uh, but more so it was a book geared towards children, just teaching that idea and that belief that it's not about your title. It's not about uh, your job. It's about who you are as a person. So the book basically follows a a young kid who is curious about what it takes to be special in life. So he goes and he talks to different people, different mentors, uh, an uh, an athlete, a Uh doctor, uh, an artist, and each one of them give him a different character trait or a different value, um, different intangible that helps you to be successful, not just in what you do, but in life. So, the athlete tells him about work ethic. Uh-huh. The firefighter t- tells him about being a servant. The artist tells him about patience, how every masterpiece takes time. Mm-hmm. So just different lessons that I, I think are really powerful for a child. And I think if you can instill those lessons in, in your child or a child, man, uh, it can really have a, a powerful impact in their life and how they perceive things. And what, a, what, what an awesome experience to be able to write that with your daughter. That's, oh, yeah. That's so cool. It Wait. really was powerful, man. Like, we did a, a book launch and everything. It was at the Center for Puppetry Arts. And I've, I mean, just I've been there a few times with, with my kids. Yeah, <laughs> man, it's, it's really powerful. And even bigger than that, because for me, it wasn't just about writing a book with her. For me, it was about more so teaching her what's possible, mm-hmm. like creating a new norm or new normal for her. Right. And so after writing that, she was like, she came back to me. And she was like, Daddy, I'm, I want to write my own book. Mm-hmm. You know, because now it's like you've created a whole new norm for your child. And I think that's one of the most powerful things we can do awesome. for our kids, man, is, is just expose them to something that now becomes a new normal for them. That's uh, it's, it's, that's a, that's a really an incredible thing. Um, talk, let, let's talk w- about the work that you're doing um, at, uh, at Game Changer Coaching. Um, you, several services that you can provide. Number one, you can be a, a, a keynote speaker for businesses who need somebody to come to an event and to speak about things like uh, leadership and team dynamics and coaching and, 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 and things like this. You also work with people with one-on-one coaching, correct? Yep. Yeah, so a lot of the work that I do with companies on the keynote presentation side and workshops stems from you know my career as an athlete, but also the experience that I've had working with several companies and organizations and associations. So uh, I've worked uh, with John Gordon. He's kind of like John Maxwell. So he speaks a lot on leadership, teamwork, mm-hmm. performance. Um, I work with an organization called Rise. They focus on DEI. So done a lot of workshop facilitation uh, with them, teaching athletes specifically how to leverage their platform, how to you know be leaders in their space and leverage their platform. Uh, and yeah, several other organizations I've either served as a keynote speaker or a workshop facilitator. When it comes to the coaching side, um, I met a company, a, a guy who worked with the company called Mainstream Leadership, and they focus on leadership and business coaching. And so I actually, this was back in like 2015, so I'm still training, Yeah, you know, in between playing. I had played with Tampa, <laughs> went up to Canada. Every off season, I was working with the company. I was getting my feet wet, wet um, mm-hmm. speaking, and just really building. And so I met a company through one of my first business engagements, 
and they train business leaders on improving their leadership and performance right. and everything. So I got certified uh, through their company, and um, it's called Life Purpose Institute. So I got my life and business coaching certification and started working with um, executives. Eventually started working with entrepreneurs, uh, athletes as well. And what I learned was that uh, by what I went through, it really gave me a framework to be able to help people improve their leadership and their performance and their personal brand. Right. So just like I went through that SWOT analysis and mm -hmm. I went through that process of identifying my, my skills and my talents and identifying my target audience, it was a lot of the same um, principles, especially as I started to really learn the formalities and the frameworks through the um, process that I went through of getting certified. Right. Um, you know, I started to understand, okay, I have a lot, I already have a lot of experiences, a lot of structure and a lot of, Things that um, I did in the sports world that applied directly to this. So exactly. I really improvised and innovated and created my own system. Um, so a lot of the clients I work with, they're either trying to um, maximize their personal brand and monetize it, mm -hmm. or they're trying to improve some part of their performance. They're trying to improve time management. They're trying to improve work-life balance or their mindset, or they're trying to improve public speaking. Yeah, so those speaking, are kind of which yeah. is like the number one. You know, exactly. everyone knows it's the number one fear that yep. everybody has. <laughs> People fear public speaking more than death. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So talk to me about the, uh, about that because I, I I know it's a it's one of your big focuses that you can help people with. Yeah. Uh, the importance of uh, a public speaking, but maybe first of all, why are people so scared of public speaking? Yeah, I, I love talking about public speaking, which yeah. is crazy. I never thought that, <laughs> right? you know, you think about a linebacker and then you think about public speaking, uh, <laughs> you know, most people would say like, man, that doesn't make any sense. There's no correlation whatsoever. Right. But this is something that I think about all the time. Um, when you think about most teams that you know and you love, who are the players that they keep around the longest? It's. The, the, the vocal leaders. Right? Exactly. The vocal leaders is the communicators. The Brian Erlockers. Exactly. Right. The Brian Erlocker. You think Ray Lewis. Mm -hmm. You think Tom Brady. Yeah. These are the guys who rally people up around them, and they lift the abilities of everyone around them. And so when I think about public speaking and leadership, it goes it goes hand in hand. Yeah. You know, you have to communicate in order to be an effective leader, and you have to be able to share about the vision and the culture, and you have to be able to share – about how to do something, not just what to do, but how to do it. The better you are with communicating, the more it uplifts everybody's performance and their productivity uh, and, and everything. And the more you can inspire, the more that's going to build morale and camaraderie and all those different things. So um, I think the reason why people are so afraid of public speaking is because, number one, it's psychological. Right. Like we're our brains are wired, as I'm sure you know, and most people know by now there's so much stuff. Um, in terms of research on, on the brain now, if you look at social media and different things like that, but our brains are wired to protect us. Right. And so <laughs> the funny thing is, and I had to realize this, and this is what I tell the people that I coach, is your brain does not know the difference between if you're standing in front of an audience of 50 people or if somebody's chasing you with a gun. It's the same. <laughs> it's the same, same response. <laughs> yeah, same fight or fight re response. Uh -huh. And so people take that response to mean that, man, I'm just so fearful of public speaking. It's like, no, your brain is just literally making you believe that somebody's chasing you with a gun. And right. so first thing you have to do is deprogram that part. And it starts with understanding and awareness. Right. That, hey, I'm just in this moment. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not being chased. Nobody's going to, you know, stab right. me or anything right, right. like that. <laughs> My life's not actually Yeah, injured. It, it feels not, like it, but right. it's not. Yeah, you got to get over that feeling. And then another thing that I tell people is, the reason why your brain has that response is because you just haven't gotten the reps. Mm -hmm. Cause if you think about anything that you've had a Very lot true. of reps with, you're not having that same response. Like when it comes to everyday things that you do driving, right. you can think of how dangerous, especially here in Atlanta. Totally. Yep. And <laughs> At any you moment. can actually see it when you have your parents come visit from out of town. That it can't <laughs> right. be a terrifying experience if you're not used to it. Exactly. But we do it every day. So do it every no day. Problem. Yeah. So that, that part of your brain that's triggered is shut off over time because of repeated exposure. Mm -hmm. And so most of us, we don't have repeated exposure. And that's why our brain, when we get in that moment, our brain's like, oh, crap, this is not familiar to me. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. It right. start, you start freaking out psychologically. Even if you are uh, able to uh, articulate yourself and communicate. And that's why you see even the most qualified, skilled, intelligent people, they get in front of an audience and they get completely afraid and start stuttering and hands yeah. start sweating. Because it's literally just your, your that part of your brain. And it, 
I even learned that um, it's part of evolution. You know, when you think about how we evolved, like from um, when we were hunters, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the only time where we were being looked at and stared at is if it was by a predator. Huh. And so that's part of our mind too that still hasn't evolved. Wow. So when we're being watched, yeah, it puts us in that mode. Yeah, it triggers us. So there's so many reasons uh, why, but I would say those those two reasons, the psychological piece and just the fact that you haven't gotten a lot of reps is a big reason why a lot of people are fearful. Wow. It's, you know, it's 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 such an interesting topic. Uh, it's it always is. It's fascinating <laughs> me how, how scared people are of public speaking. But again, with, with reps and with preparation, yeah, it's something that you can, that, that you absolutely can overcome. And that, that uh, coaching, being coached through that by a professional like yourself Definitely. Uh, can be a huge, huge help. You know, if uh, th- there's no need to be scared of it, just get the training that you need, develop that skill set. Um, and it's an incredibly uh, powerful tool to have oh, under yeah. your belt. Yeah, and you talk about, I mean, a way to separate yourself from the competition. If you can get comfortable and being in front of a crowd and articulating your thoughts, not in a way where you're a robot and right. Uh, no knock against Toastmasters, love Toastmasters, sure. but uh, it's great to not have the ums and all those different things, but <laughs> right. <laughs> that to me is not the essence of public speaking. Like when you can really move people's hearts and people's minds and change their perspectives, like that's some serious powerful power. And mm-hmm. also another aspect of public speaking that people don't think about is the fact that it's a, it gives you a different value proposition. So you think about somebody who's in your space of, of life insurance or financial services or somebody who's a personal trainer or somebody who's an attorney or a consultant, like you have one level of pricing that you could offer somebody if you just are one-on-one with them, right? Mm-hmm. You have another level if they uh, discover you through social media and they go through your ad. Right. Now, if you are in a state on a stage in front of 300 to 500 people seen as an expert, that's a whole different value proposition. Mm-hmm. It, it just exponentially increases your value and your worth and what you can charge somebody yep. because of location. And so that's something that a lot of people don't think about in terms of public speaking the import- and the importance of it. And another Absolutely. thing I'll add is in this day and age of AI and just how everything is becoming so automated and, yep. um, you know, just machines are replacing everybody. I, I don't know the exact statistics, but I know <laughs> a lot of jobs are going to be, be replaced. Absolutely. Yep. One of the most important skills I believe is, is going to be public speaking. It's going to continue to be a valuable skill and a, uh, just something that sets, uh, separates you. And, uh, and it's, it's age, literally yeah. useful in, any in any field that I can think of, yeah. uh, the ability to speak, maybe even if not from a stage in front of a ton of people, but being able to uh, effectively communicate in pressure situations, professional situations, when people are looking at you, that is always going to be yeah. uh, something that is going to be applicable and 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 useful in any field that you might choose to right. to, to pursue. Um, but it's, it's obviously not just public speaking that you help people with. You you. You can train people with entrepreneurship, team dynamics, um, uh, work-life balance, uh, motivation, right? Yeah. Uh, success uh, is is something that that I know that that you cover a lot. And the idea of what does success mean to you? So I'll actually ask that question to you, Rennie. What mm-hmm. what does success mean to Rennie Kerr? Yeah, and that's such a powerful question um, for all of us to navigate and to ask ourselves, man. And this is something that I see a lot of times with. A lot of successful people, a lot of high performers, a lot of CEOs, like you'll ask them, like, what, what is your main goal? Like, what is success ultimately to you? And many of them do not do not know. And when you're not able to define that or take the time to really extract what that means, uh, what happens is what I call toxic ambition. And that's basically where you're just chasing something. You're just chasing this, this next level, whatever mm-hmm. that is. You're just chasing here without realizing that one, it comes with a cost, you know, that you may be sacrificing something for that, you know, and, and it's not healthy. Right. Maybe um, it's time with family. Maybe exactly. it's, it's uh, work-life balance. Yeah. Time with family. Health. Be, friendships. Yeah. Right. How many uh, people do we know or have we known? Because <laughs> mm-hmm. they're no longer around anymore. It's like they were so successful business-wise, but then one day, boom. They literally worked themselves to death. Right? Exactly. And so you you really have to get clear on what success is for you and why, you know, what's feeling that what's at the root of that? Is it just ego? Is it just pride? Is it you trying to prove somebody wrong Mm -hmm. 
or whatever, or is this something like legacy, impact, influence, faith, you know? And for me, success uh, really is about, number one, maximizing my God-given gifts and abilities and helping others do the same. Yeah, it's those two things. Every every single day I'm about growth. I'm about getting to that next level. Not just because I, I just want to get more followers because I want to increase revenue. I mean, all those things are cool. Mm-hmm. But really it's about, you know, I know that I was given a gift, a skill, and I don't want to waste it. I want to be a good steward of what I've been given. And then I also want to teach other people how to do the exact same thing because we all have gifts. We all have skills and abilities. And it's bigger than us. Yeah. You know, and that's something I genuinely believe awesome how how do you how do you stay motivated um you have long-term goals yeah um what are your keys for staying motivated to achieve long-term goals yeah i think it really starts with humility you know if you want to stay motivated you also have to know those areas that you need to work on right and so if you (laughs) if you're comfortable if you're looking at yourself like you've arrived if you are sipping the kool-aid and what, what one of my good friends uh ben newman like to call if you're seduced by success, you're you're just it's human nature for you not to stay motivated. But if you are constantly looking at okay, and not to say you shouldn't celebrate your accomplishments and uh, your achievements and the sure. growth that you have, but if you balance that with saying okay, um, yes, I'm good here, and this this has nothing to do with just professionally. This has everything to do with you as a holistic person because you may be once again, and we see it happen all the time where we put such a premium on our success professionally, but then our professional lives, we're bench warmers, like we're struggling, Mm -hmm. but we don't value it the same. Right. And so we end up substituting that professional success for our personal success. Uh Right. So I look at it holistically, like, yes, I may be great over here uh, and I may be getting standing ovations every time I speak, but if I come home and I suck in terms of communication and my relationship with my daughter isn't great, then I got work to do. Yeah. And that's what keeps me motivated is, man, how how close can I get to being successful and efficient uh, and effective in all these different different areas of my life? Yeah. Spiritually, physically, financially, emotionally, you know, relationally, Mm -hmm. all those areas. And so that's my gauge of how I'm moving and how I'm progressing, not just how well my numbers were in Q1 versus Q2. Right. But it's it's all those other areas that, um, like I said, sometimes we put on the back burner. That is, uh, that's, that's very well said. Um, it's very well said. Some people just automatically think success. What does success mean? And you immediately go to yeah. how successful are you at work? How much money do you have? What, what kind of car do you drive? You know, how, how big is your house? Yeah. But success really is holistic, right? It has to be. If you're rich in the, in the business part, you know, the professional part, but you've lost touch with all of your friends and you have yeah. you know, a, a failing marriage and you're unhappy. Right. How successful are you really, right? Yeah, I, I think about it all the time, and I, I never want to get be that person who I can look at my bank account, and it's great, but I have no, uh, I'm broke mm-hmm. internally. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I'm spiritually broke, I'm, I'm physically broke, and I'm just no fulfillment, you yeah. know, I, no purpose. Right. Like, yeah, money, I, and that's one of the most powerful moments I had and experience I had by being in the league after my first year was when I got my first paycheck, uh, first installment of my signing bonus. And I sat there and I looked at my bank account, I, <laughs> uh, my Bank of America account, and, you know, I had this high. And you hear a lot of a lot of people talk about this, but you have this high, this emotional high where you're like, man, I made it, I'm yeah. good. Yep. And then I remember coming back to myself in that moment, and I was in my townhouse. There was nobody else there. I'm you know, four hours away from home. This was my first time ever really being away from the South, being away from Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So it's empty. Nobody's there. And when I tell you, man, that silence was so loud in that moment because I realized, dang, I'm still the same person. I just have more money. But, uh, and then I had that thought, like, you mean to tell me, like, I've been working my whole life and this is it. This, This, I just, just for this feeling that's fleeting. It left. Yeah, it it left. Yeah, and then I realized, man, I still got problems. I still got, you know, this, 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 this. Mm -hmm. There's certain things that, and in that moment, it makes it so much more powerful understanding that there's uh, things that money can't buy. It really hits hard, and it's depressing, like, when you realize that, man, no matter how much I make, there's just certain things that it it can't buy. It can't, you know, if you you don't have a real relationship with somebody that you love, then – 
that money and having it makes it so much worse. The fact yep. that you don't have that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's um. So you you can with your coaching, mm-hmm. you cover all of this. And I mean, the, yeah, it yeah, seems yeah. like a lot to cover, right? I mean, you're <laughs> you're helping people be a better professional, but you're also making you know making sure that you're providing training on the holistic success as opposed to just the business success. Um, is there, is that challenging for you? I mean, one thing that I've been thinking of as we've been going through this is like, man, did this just turn into like for your Mm one-on-ones with clients, does it kind of turn into therapy sessions for, (laughs) for a a little bit? It can lead to that. I will say that, but ultimately like a lot of us, we know deep inside those areas that we need to work on or those areas of growth. But many times we just need that accountability and that structure. So that's really what I provide. You know, I don't necessarily say, hey, these are the things we're going to cover, you know, boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. It's more so like, hey, where do you want to be at in the next six to eight months? Where do you want to be at by the end of the month? What are your three most important goals? If you can wave a magic wand and you can accomplish those things, what would they be? And Mm -hmm. so we build from there. And it's through that journey of trying to accomplish those main goals, whether it's like improving, um, you know, your output on mm-hmm. your job or becoming a more present father or parent. Um, it's through the, the journey of achieving those goals that we start to peel back those layers right. uh, and, and look at those inefficiencies and look at those, you know, those self-defeating thoughts and those things that may be holding you back. So um, that's where it becomes holistic because in order to achieve those goals, a lot of times it involves a holistic approach. And because you're only looking at it from one way, you are not acknowledging the blind spots that exist. Right. So that's where I come in like a coach would, just like my coach did yep. when I played, um, you know, that would help me uncover those blind spots and challenge me to take things in another level on a consistent basis. Incredible. So if if somebody has someone that they know uh, who needs a dynamic keynote speaker for, you know, an upcoming event, uh, you know, for their business, or if someone watching feels that they could benefit um, from you, from your coaching, from, you know, amazing leadership personal development, or personal branding coach, um, they should reach out to you, RennieCurran.com, right? Yes, sir, RennieCurran.com, and uh, I'm available also if you want to reach out, uh, whether it's LinkedIn, Instagram, we start there, and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, you, you get the uh, website through there. Um, we'll be more than happy to connect, man. I'm, I'm somebody, I love relationships. I right. love, I'm very big on strategic partnerships and things like that. So even if you don't necessarily have a need in terms of coaching, but you uh, serve a target audience that does like right. you may be a consultant, you may be like a, a, a CPA mm-hmm. and you work with financial advisors and they need help with improving their mindset or, you know, you're a leader of an organization and um, you want to bring somebody in to talk about uh, how to overcome adversity, how to, you know, thrive during times of, um, you know, challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, I'm your guy. And I love, uh, just going in, not just delivering a canned speech, but really getting to know that organization. Like, yeah. you know, what's their vision? What's their values? Uh, what's their objectives for this quarter? And I really get to know them. I interview at least, um, and this is just something I do um, as just an added value piece with speaking and everything. But mm-hmm. I interview at least uh, three to four people within the organization, somebody who's early in their career, somebody who's middle of the road, somebody who's a veteran, right. just to understand those different perspectives and to understand their language as well. Mm-hmm. And I implement those pieces, like in terms of their principles and their, their strategies, like and understanding what are the key behaviors that drive their performance, right. Implement that into my messaging so that when I'm talking about my story or when I'm sharing about a principle is not something that's just for me. Right. It's you not tie some, it in. Yeah. I the, tie it in. Audience. I tie in their language. I tie in their values and their core beliefs. And it's just more relevant. It's more valuable. And they know that I'm there for them, not just to talk about myself. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, one, one thing I loved when I was exploring the website is that if you, you have testimonial videos, yeah. tons of them, uh, from people who have had you speak as a keynote speaker. You also have uh, testimonials from people who have hired you as the one-on-one sort of coaching. So mm-hmm. if you people are curious about what does this journey look like, you know, um, you have those testimonial videos right there on your site, um, and you could hear from, you know, third parties about the uh, the awesome experience they've had working with Randy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Randy, it's been an amazing discussion. I could go literally on and on for another, like, two hours. Um, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your, your, your experience, uh, with us. Uh, it's, it's been a fantastic discussion. I'm really, really glad that, uh, that you were 
willing to come here and, and take part in it. Yes, sir. Thanks so much for having me again, man. Amazing job. Thanks for all the questions, man. And <laughs> excited to see the impact that this is going to have. And once again, if there's anybody listening um, that you're going through some challenging times, just like I mentioned earlier, just keep going, keep working in the dark, keep um, trusting in faith and, and just, you know, good things will happen. I, I can guarantee it. I'm a living, breathing example of it, man. So thank you. you absolutely are. Thank you so much, Randy. Listen to this interview and more on the Alliance Group Podcast.